What's up guys and welcome to The Bad Batch Season 3 Episode 1. Now, right off the bat, this was a super dark and gritty episode, had a very dark undertone, and we really got to see more of not just Omega and Crosshair and their dynamic and their character evolution, but also much more of the Empire and just what they're doing. I particularly found this episode interesting for the M count testing, where they would have the blood of the clones put into vials, and then they would drop what I assume is Palpatine's blood sample, and to see if his midichlorians would bind to the clone's blood themselves. So let's begin episode one's breakdown. And before we do, throw a thumbs up on this video, and we can begin. As we start the new season, we pick up what seems to be in a small bit of a time jump. This episode really just establishes how dangerous the planet surrounding Mount Tantis is. It's basically Jurassic Park, with tons of massive creatures and monsters, which we see with the stormtroopers crashing nearby and being eaten. Omega is reclaiming her old position as lab assistant, where her blood is being taken to check her M count, this is her midichlorian count, or rather, how she can actually adapt to a high M count, as they check all of the subjects and the clones here. Now, this M count is in hopes of a suitable match for Palpatine to continue his project Necromancer, which is kind of what Snoke became. Essentially, her M count is significant because it means her body won't reject Palpatine's midichlorians if they're mixed with her. We meet up with Nalase and Omega tells her that her blood needs to be checked, at which point Nalase immediately deletes the records of it and the blood sample. She knows exactly what the Empire is trying to do and probably deletes it because she knows what Omega was created for, most likely a suitable host for Palpatine. She does this because Omega is very special. She carries a very high M count, and if the Empire found out, they would use her for her blood and cells to further Palpatine's evil plans to live forever, most likely killing her. Nalase enters the highly secured pathway to something we don't know about yet, which as we saw in the third episode, leads to the same type of layout as Exegol with the pods of Snoke being created. Now, in the third episode here, which we're going to get into in major detail, I don't know if Snoke is necessarily in the chamber or the tomb or the back to tank, whatever it is. It could very well be Snoke or it could be a young Palpatine, which I think would be much more interesting. Omega makes friends with one of the hounds that guard the perimeter of the Mount Tantis. She feeds her some snacks, illegally of course, and the hound will help them later on in the end, befriending them. You can kind of see this coming. Omega goes to the cells of the clones and sees them like prisoners in there. It's really a dark environment, like the Empire just does not take good care of the clones at all. They're really expendable, which is the opposite of what Plo Koon told them. She speaks to Crosshair at his cell and the two have a back and forth about planning an escape. He says that he's tired and that she should forget about him. We basically see their polarity. Crosshair has lost hope. He's pessimistic, cynical. Whereas Omega is super optimistic, she trusts everyone and finds the good in everyone. I would say both aren't ideal. You need someone in the middle, someone maybe like Hunter. Now, I feel like Omega hasn't been tainted and jaded by the realities of the world and bad people over and over again like Crosshair has. So she's much more positive, much more naive, and that's just her nature as well. During the exchange, we notice Crosshair's hands are trembling so he's no longer got his abilities of a steady hand. This affects his aim and sniper shot, of course. He's a very broken man, and he needs to find his way again. Omega marks the wall, just like Rey did in The Force Awakens. Now, I saw some members in the chat during the live stream of the watch party saying that she is going to fall in love with Palpatine's clone and that they'll have Rey. Yeah, it's not a bad theory, but probably unlikely. Not much else happens other than the Groundhog Day events that just keep transpiring. She continues to assist the medics and Nalase continues to delete her blood draws to avoid the Empire from knowing the truth about Omega, of which she herself doesn't even know. Omega goes over more escape plans with Crosshair and he gets really annoyed, saying that she needs to just stick to the mission objective, which is to escape and she needs to do that by leaving him alone, leaving the hound behind, and just focusing on the one mission, which is to save herself. He says that if he were in her position, he would leave her behind as well, and she just couldn't believe it. Omega is very naive, very good-natured, and very pure-hearted. She says, no way, you're my brother, you wouldn't. And he says that he's not them, meaning he's not his brothers. Still, of course, showing the hatred that he has for them and the fact that he is not like them. He says that he belongs in here, and this to me kind of is like 
when Vader told Luke, it is too late for me, my son. So it's almost like he kind of accepts that he isn't really the greatest person and maybe belongs in this place. This is like his karma or what he deserves now at this point. Where she turns around and says no one belongs in here. And once again, that shows how kind and humane and pure hearted she really is. That even after everything Crosshair has done, you know, he doesn't belong here. As seen on her bedroom wall, a lot of time has passed, 125 days already, or more than four months. Hemlock leaves the high security room and says if the M count cannot meet or exceed the specimen, meaning Palpatine's, midichlorian count, then all will fail. So this means that they need to find a host that can handle his level of midichlorians and power. I guess kind of like what they were trying to do with Grogu. She cleans the wound of the Hound, the Hound heals, the droid wants to terminate it anyways, and so Omega takes control, sets the Hound free, and destroys the droid. Kind of the same way Obi-Wan destroyed the Magna Guards in Episode 3 by dropping the massive weight on them. Sort of in the same position, and then taking out their heads. Hemlock punishes her by threatening to hurt Crosshair, so she's kind of stuck now. She's given back her stuffed animal that was taken away earlier from Emery, who starts to show signs of care for Omega. And we're starting to see that she's getting a little soft. The episode ends with Omega hearing the hound in the forest, now free. All right, on to episode two. Bad Batch season three, episode two was really a quick episode. There's a few things that I'll explain and run down because they are important. But as for the breakdown in general for this one, it's really not long. It starts off with Wrecker and Hunter delivering a pike from the Pike Syndicate to the Durand family. Now, Lady Durand gives the location of Mount Tantis to Hunter and Wrecker, where they're given the location of his lab, as Mount Tantis is still a very secret base and no one really knows where it is, at least not outsiders. Echo and Rex need two rotations until they can meet the boys at the coordinates, which is great, now we're gonna see Rex. So Hunter says he's going anyways, and Wrecker tells him, remember what happened to Tech, essentially. They land on a jungle planet and find Hemlock's lab destroyed. As they try to get down there, they find young clones who ambush them. They were left here by the Empire who transferred them off Kamino to sample their blood. The Empire was testing to see their M count in hopes of a suitable host for Palpatine. They get attacked by slither vines that the Empire created as some sort of experiment, which is why they abandoned the lab after it got out of control. They meet up at their cave, and one of the voices is played by Daniel Logan, who played Little Boba Fett in Episode 2, Attack of the Clones, with Jango Fett. My personal favorite bounty hunter. They head to the lab where there's a control room, told to them by the little clones, with a control panel that still gets a signal out there, but there's no power. So they go to jumpstart the power. They get in and dodge a ton of slither vines, which kind of have a massive aliens vibe to them. They all get out of there and Hunter goes over Hemlock's data that they retrieved, where they get some more leads on Mount Tantis. But first, they decide to drop the three off with Fat Mace Windu <laughs> on that tropical island. Mace Windu granted the rank of Sushi Master. Avatar the way of Fat Windu. He tells them that they can make their own path and be something other than a soldier. So the end of the episode here, and again, it's a bit of a filler, sure, but it does double down on the autonomy of the clones and that they can choose their own lives instead of being brainwashed, expendable clones like the Empire wanted them to be. Also, we get the mention of Fat Mace and Rex is returning soon. On to episode three. Welcome to The Bad Batch, Season 3, Episode 3. I honestly feel like Episode 3 is kind of like what should have been the premiere episode of the whole season. The first episode. A ton of stuff happened in this one, and I'm going to explain a lot of things that I found to be really interesting, with leaving out a lot of the stuff that we don't really need to worry about. So let's get right to it. We're back on Mount Tantis. Omega is greeted by Emery, where she fulfills her role as lab assistant once again. Omega notices a ton of clone commando troopers around and finds it to be a bit weird. So Nala Se deletes the blood sample taken by Emery once again to protect Omega, as Hemlock tells her an unexpected guest is coming, and this of course is Palpatine. Nala Se warns Omega of her blood being tested and how she'll be in grave danger if it is, imploring her to escape, to retrieve her data pad, and to use it to get out of there. Doing so, her blood sample is in the machine to be mixed with midichlorian-rich blood 
eventually, when we switch scenes to Palpatine arriving, his royal red guards escorting him with the doctor, who tells him that they have quadrupled their efficacy and experimenting exotic matter facilities to test much larger assets. I think this could be for things like potentially the Zillow Beast and other larger creatures that Palpatine wants to experiment with for different reasons. They enter the highly secured room with red shields. As Omega continues her escape, she goes to Crosshair's cell and tells him to distract the stormtroopers, when he does so and gives them an order. They scoff and we see how the stormtroopers think they're higher in command than clones, which is how the Empire has basically made things to be. That clones are obsolete and stormtroopers are the upgrade, when in reality it's so the opposite. Palpatine just wanted a larger army and he felt clones were too costly for the size of the army that he wanted. He wanted to make the galaxy fear his sheer size of police force, rather than having insanely well-trained soldiers like clones. Omega and Crosshair take out the guards after she opens the doors with Nalase's data pad, escaping. She notices Crosshair's hand is getting worse. So this is because, I think, of the experiments being done to him, the midichlorians that they're probably pumping into his body and injecting into him to see what happens are actually making him sick. So it's like his body is rejecting them. So he could have some potential for force powers, but it's too early to tell. The room Palpatine enters, which we've all been waiting for here, is similar to the one on Exegol in Star Wars Episode Nine: The Rise of Skywalker, with the vats of specimens and test tubes, they're all in a circle and then one larger one in the middle. As Palpatine walks up to it, opens it and smirks. Now, during the watch party, I thought and everyone thought that this is Snoke's body. But look, what I really hope it is, is a young Palpatine body as Snoke is still about 50 plus years away from happening in the sequel trilogy. We have tons of time to explore and explain why the perfect M-Count clone body wasn't found or used by Palpatine, resulting in his less than capable clone body that we saw in Episode 9, Rise of Skywalker. Omega and Crosshair are stopped by Emery when they finally stun her and continue to escape. So Palpatine explains that this facility as he's walking out with Dr. Hemlock needs to remain hidden and secure. He says that many in the galaxy and even here in the facility would consider Dr. Hemlock's work an abomination. Now, in the Episode 9 Rise of Skywalker novel, Snoke is explained as, you guessed it, an abomination. Check this out. The heretics of the Sith Eternal toiled, splicing genes, bolstering tissue, creating unnatural abominations, in the hope that one of these strand casts would succeed and become a worthy receptacle. So right there we can see that Snoke was indeed referred to as some sort of a abomination, just like Palpatine is explaining here. So Palpatine leaves the base and Dr. Hemlock is immediately told that Omega and Crosshair have escaped. Emery rats them out and tells Hemlock that Omega has someone's data pad to help them get out of there. So of course the doctor assumes that Nalase helped Omega escape and they sound the alarms to capture the fugitives. Now at this point Hemlock doesn't know the truth about Omega's blood sample which we're going to see in just a few minutes that it's exactly what he's looking for. And this is why I think that the Bad Batch probably, they either hide Omega really well, or she perishes, or they ruin Palpatine's plans for the perfect host somehow. Which is why he's left with the messed up body that he has in Episode 9. Omega and Crosshair fight off the clone troopers in the forest as she tries to repel up one of the Imperial ships floating overhead, when the Hound that she befriended saves the day, which I guess we all could have expected. This allows her to get aboard. Crosshair has trouble aiming, so he ends up just punching out the troopers in hand-to-hand -hand combat. They take over the ship and they get out of there as they're being shot down. When Omega's blood test finally goes through and Emery sees it shows positive as a candidate for Palpatine's midichlorians without sustaining any degradation, Hemlock is finally informed and calls off his troops, saying that she must not be killed. Omega and Crosshair use this moment to jump to light speed. Hemlock is annoyed but calls it a small setback, saying that he has the full resources of the Empire at his disposal, meaning, I think, Vader and every bounty hunter. So this means, you know, we could get Asajj Ventress, Vader coming into play to find them. All bounty hunters like Boba Fett, Cad Bane, Heck, maybe they'll bring Dengar into this or Bosk and Fennec Shand. Now, why I say Asajj Ventress, even though she's supposed to be dead at this point, according to the 
Dark Disciple novel after she was killed by Count Dooku in Furious Lightning is because in the screeners for The Bad Batch Season 3, we did see her. And the actress actually goes on to say that this is just a taste of Asajj and we're going to see a lot more of her. So either these are flashbacks or she's actually not dead. Personally, I really like this episode. I don't like how they're connecting it to the sequel trilogy, but in my mind, I'm thinking that, all right, you know what? They're going to try and set up something that was supposed to be much more grand than what the Palpatine we saw in episode nine actually floated his consciousness into, meaning there was supposed to be an entity that was much stronger and much more capable than what happened to him. And the whole Snoke thing, I mean, I would love it if Luke ends up fighting a young Palpatine clone who is the perfect vessel and is actually what Palpatine is using for a bit, or his training or whatever, all in the hopes of eventually transferring his essence into this being when Luke ends up fighting and killing him, or something happens to him. Maybe the Bad Batch, maybe Vader, maybe, I don't know, who, who knows what they're going to write. But I think it would make a lot of sense if they eventually have Luke fighting this young Palpatine, kind of like a Joris Sabaoth from Heir to the Empire, but just switching it up and taking inspiration from Heir to the Empire and changing things around. Do I want them to go into the whole cloning thing with Snoke and all that? No, not necessarily. I don't. I don't like the sequel trilogy. In fact, I think it really ruined a lot of things, but that is the direction they're going, and I would love to explain how I think, or rather, how I hope, yeah, how I hope, they're going to create some sort of story in between this time, which will eventually be destroyed or burned or killed or whatever happens to this being or this antagonist that they're about to create and introduce to us, hoping it's not Snoke, which will result in the pathetic form that Palpatine was in in episode nine. These are just my theories. I hope they come true. I'm looking forward to the next watch party with you guys next week. And until then, I'll be reading your theories down below in the comments. Find me on Instagram at Star Wars Theory. And of course, check out my website at theorysabers.com. Hope you all have a great day and may the force be with you always.